on World News Tonight. Dark future ahead. Experts in India warn the nation of 1.5 billion of the nighttime power cuts over the summer. Self sabotage? Reports show that a pro Ukrainian group sabotaged the Nord Stream. Is there any evidence? Find out tonight. More UFOs. The Pentagon reports more UFO sightings around the world, saying that there's a possibility of some being extraterrestrial. Martial art celebrations. Sikhs in India celebrate Holi with colorful martial arts displays. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers watching other there in no world news. We have a number of comprehensive coverages lined up for you tonight and we start off our bulletin with the coming of a potentially unprecedented power crisis in India. The country faces a high risk of nighttime power cuts this summer and in coming years as delays in adding new coal fired and hydropower capacity could limit the country's ability to address surging electricity demand when solar energy is not available. A rapid addition of solar farms has helped India avert daytime supply gaps, but a shortage of coal-fired and hydropower capacity risks exposing millions to widespread outages at night. India's power availability in non-solar hours this April is expected to be 1.7% lower than peak demand, a measure of the maximum electricity requirement over any given time. April nighttime peak demand is expected to hit 217 gigawatts, up 6.4% on the highest nighttime levels recorded in April last year. While Indians looking to beat the heat this summer will want steady power for their air conditioners, nighttime outage risks threaten industries that operate around the clock, including auto, electronics, steel, bar and fertilizer manufacturing plants. After the Grid India report, the government brought forward maintenance at some coal-fired power plants and secured extra gas-fired capacity to run to try to avert outages. As much as 189.2 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity is expected to be available this April, according to Grid India's February note. That would be up more than 11% from last year, according to calculations based on Grid India data. Together, coal, nuclear and gas capacity are expected to meet about 83% of peak demand at night. Hydropower will be crucial not only to meet much of the remaining supply, but also as a flexible generator, as coal-fired plants cannot be ramped up and down quickly to address variability in demand. Meanwhile, rallies marking International Women's Day took place around the world with a focus on Afghanistan where girls are denied the right to education and Iran, which has seen mass protests on women's rights in recent months. Women have also demanded action on high rates of unsolved killings of women and girls across South America from Montevideo on the Atlantic coast on the Andean city of Quito. Thousands took the streets, including indigenous people, students and workers. In Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, women demanded the legislation of abortion and action on femicides, while in Chile's Santiago protesters, dancers, artists and even pets crammed the streets. By nightfall in Mexico's second largest city, Monterey protesters clashed with police in some such local government palace gate on fire. In Manila, activists called for equal rights and better wages coupled with police blocking their protests. Turkish police fired pepper spray to disperse protesters in Istanbul. In recent days, Iran's clerical rulers have faced renewed pressure as public anger was compounded by a wave of poisonings affecting girls in dozens of schools. Iran has arrested several people it said were linked to the poisonings and accused some of the connections to foreign-based dissident media. As Washington marked International Women's Day, the United States imposed sanctions on two senior Iranian prison officials it accused of being responsible for serious rights abuses against women and girls. Australia is expected to buy up to five U.S. Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarines in 2030s as part of a landmark defense agreement between Washington, Canberra and London in a deal that would present a new challenge to China. The agreement known as AUKUS Pact will have multiple stages that at least one U.S. submarine visiting Australian ports in the coming years and end in the late 2030s with a new class of submarines being built with British designs and American technology. U.S. President Joe Biden will host leaders of Australia and Britain in San Diego on Monday to chart a way forward for provision the nuclear-powered submarines and other high-tech weaponry to Australia. 
China has condemned the effort by the Western allies who are seeking to counter China's military buildup, pressure on Taiwan and increasingly muscular deployments in the contested South China Sea. Two of the officials speaking on the condition of anonymity said that after the annual port visits, the United States would forward deploy some submarines in Western Australia by around 2027. In the early 2030s, Australia would buy three Virginia-class submarines and have the option to buy two more. AUKUS is expected to be Australia's biggest ever defence project over the prospects of jobs in all three countries. Under the initial AUKUS deal announced in 2021, the United States and Britain agreed to provide Australia with the technology and capability to deploy nuclear-powered submarines as part of joint efforts to counter the increasing threat posed by China in the Indo-Pacific region. But a deal between the three countries on how specifically to achieve that goal had not been ironed out. A new blame game is being passed around in relation to the Nord Stream pipeline attack with the latest research suggesting a potential false flag operation in order to revert increasing support for Ukraine. Germany's government is warning that the story in the New York Times this week that a pro-Ukrainian group may be behind the sabotage of the Nord Stream gas pipelines last year should be treated with caution because the attack could still have been a so-called false flag operation. In other words, the true perpetrators could have staged the incident to blame Ukraine even if that country had nothing to do with it. The reactions to the story from world powers highlight both the mystery of the incident and the secretive nature of their war plans. Germany's defense minister, Boris Pistorius, on Wednesday said it wouldn't be the first time such a false flag event happened and that there were what he called expert opinions indicating it without elaborating. He was at a summit in Stockholm, also attended by NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg Good morning. and Ukraine's Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov, who called the media reports strange and that the incident had nothing to do with Ukraine's government. The New York Times story revolves around intelligence reportedly reviewed by U.S. officials. The Times says the intelligence reports draw no firm conclusions, but that pro-Ukraine saboteurs were likely behind it. It also said there was no evidence that Ukrainian President Zelensky or any of his top officials played a role. The possible motive, according to the Times, that destroying the pipeline would remove a potential method for Russia to get leverage over Europe through gas exports. It is something that Ukraine and its allies had warned about for years. The Russian government has suggested that the New York Times report could be a coordinated effort to divert attention. Meanwhile, two other reports from the German newspaper Zeit and ARD, a news channel, say that authorities have identified a boat used in the sabotage. The outlets said it was a yacht rented by five men and a woman using forged passports and that their true nationalities are unknown. The German media also said it was rented by a Polish company owned by Ukrainians. German federal prosecutors on Wednesday confirmed that they raided the yacht, but that it was chartered by a German company. More world news on the other side of this short commercial break. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, a Harvard University astronomer and the head of the Pentagon's UFO office teamed up to release a draft paper that claims that there is a possibility of evidence of extraterrestrial life following the detection of one such object in the Earth's atmosphere. Move over, Chinese spy balloon, or whatever else U.S. fighter jets shot down last month. Tonight, out of Harvard University, a draft paper about mysterious flying objects sounding almost like science fiction. Like oh, thing. Renowned Harvard astronomer Avi Loeb, teaming up with the new head of the Pentagon's UFO office, dubbed the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Together, they say that interstellar objects detected in space could be signs of extraterrestrial life and that current sky mapping technology like the James Webb Space Telescope could miss such objects. Professor Loeb now leading the charge to build better arrays of sensors to capture anomalies, but saying for now everything is hypothetical, and his paper is really meant to remind UFO hunters not to forget the laws of physics. Meanwhile, more videos surfacing showing odd objects have been leaked to documentary UFO filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, who recently released pictures of an orb shape over Mosul, and these images showing a cylinder flying over a rock. 
The Pentagon not commenting on the recent videos, but confirming prior videos released by Corbell had been filmed by service members. As for what they are, definitive explanations remain out of reach. U.S. President Joe Biden slammed Tucker Carlson over the Fox News' horse portrayal of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol amid growing bipartisan condemnation of coverage that downplayed the insurrection. Tonight, for the first time, President Biden weighing in, blasting Republicans and Fox News opinion host Tucker Carlson for misrepresenting the January 6th attack after Carlson again aired select new footage. The president tweeting, more than 140 officers were injured on January 6th. I've said before, how dare anyone diminish or deny the hell they went through? I hope House Republicans feel ashamed. While Carlson showed some images of the violence, he presented presented an alternate reality of the day, falsely describing it as, quote, mostly peaceful chaos, airing footage of the suspect, known as the QAnon shaman, who was sentenced to 41 months in prison. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. Being walked around the Capitol by police. The Capitol Police chief not commenting on the specifics of the video, but calling the overall report filled with offensive and misleading conclusions. Carlson was given the footage by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The bottom line is there's finally transparency. But many Republicans are denouncing the Fox News host. I think it's bullshit. It was an outrageous act. Uh, a lot of people were injured. Meanwhile, newly revealed evidence in the Dominion Voting System's defamation suit against Fox News shows soon after the election, some at Fox News wanted to move on from former President Trump, including Carlson, who texted a fellow Fox employee, quote, I hate him passionately. Thousands of people staged a second straight day of protests in the Georgian capital Tbilisi, rallying outside the parliament against a foreign agent's law, which critics say signals an authoritarian shift. Chanting slogans to the sound of drums and waving the Georgian and European flags side by side, tens of thousands march on the streets of Tbilisi for a second consecutive day to say no to the controversial law on foreign agents. We are here and we are ready to Russian law. I cannot call it any else because it's completely Russian law controlled and imposed upon us by Russia. The opposition and those in protest say the bill is reminiscent of a draconian Russian law adopted in 2012 to repress critics and the media. The proposed legislation stipulates that organizations could be classified as foreign agents if they receive more than 20 percent of funding from abroad. Georgia's pro-European president has pledged to veto the draft law if passed by parliament, although the veto can be overridden to force the laws through. So it's really a law uh, that uh, resembles very much to that uh, that has been adopted uh, in Russia and uh, in other countries. It's not a law for a democratic country. It's not a law for European country. It's just the fact of the law and not necessarily the content, but the fact uh, is distancing us from the European Union. Anti-Moscow sentiment runs strong in the former Soviet Union nation, following Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 over the status of two Moscow-backed breakaway regions. Crypto Winter has taken yet another victim, Silvergate. With over a decade of service in the crypto banking industry, the company is forced to liquidate following the collapse of one of its integral customers, the FTX exchange. One of the main banks lending to the crypto industry says it is shutting down and liquidating. On Wednesday, Silvergate Capital cited recent industry and regulatory developments for winding down after having served the crypto industry for a decade. Silvergate now finds itself the latest victim of the so-called crypto winter. Jitters in the digital asset industry after the implosion of one of the company's major customers, the exchange FTX, in November. The company said in a statement it would repay depositors as part of its liquidation plan. Silvergate is based in California and served high-profile firms like Coinbase and Galaxy Digital. But the collapse of FTX, its sister firm Alameda Research and arrest of their founder Sam Bankman-Fried for fraud and other crimes caused a run on deposits at Silvergate. 
Customers pulled more than $8 billion from the platform late last year, and the firm reported a $1 billion loss for the fourth quarter. Multiple partners severed ties with Silvergate last week after it warned about its viability and its sale last year of additional debt securities at a loss. Federal prosecutors in Washington are also investigating Silvergate and its links to FTX and Alameda Research. In Somalia, the number of people forced to flee from doubt and conflict has reached a new high of 3.8 million people. International organizations, now warn hundreds of thousands more, could follow in the coming months. It's a story that's become all too common in Somalia. After the crops and cattle on their farm were decimated by drought, Faduma Ali and her seven children were forced to flee towards the nearest city. A perilous week-long journey which they didn't all survive. I fled my home after the drought hit our farm and we lost all our animals. We walked for seven days. One of my children didn't make it. Faduma now lives in a makeshift camp on the outskirts of Baidoa, some 250 kilometers west of Mogadishu. The city hosts around 600,000 refugees, all forcefully displaced by conflict and climate change. The International Organization for Migration, which administers the camp, has been doing its best to welcome these families. But with resources stretched to the limit, it can only provide the most basic of services. The organization recently called for international donations in order to tackle the root causes of the crisis and help displaced persons build a more stable future. It's about securing their future um, by making sure that they have land that they own and can live on safely without fear of eviction, that they have water, sustainable um, water supply, that they have access to livelihood. Somalia is experiencing one of its worst droughts on record with five consecutive seasons of insufficient rain. A drought that's expected to continue in 2023 potentially displacing another 300,000 people by the summer. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Japan's lower house of parliament approved the government's nominees for next central bank governor and deputy governor, signing off on the new leadership that will be tasked with steering a smooth exit from ultra loose monetary policies. Russian missile struck cities across Ukraine, including the capital Kyiv, the Black Sea port of Odessa, and the second city of Kharkiv. The missiles hit a wide arc of targets, including the cities stretching from Zitron near the West Dnipro in central Ukraine. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Australian counterpart Anthony Albanese attended the fourth and final cricket test match between the two nations. The world's biggest stadium will host more than 100,000 viewers and may topple Melbourne Cricket Ground's record of hosting a match with 121,696 fans. Three Los Angeles police officers were shot and suspected were barricaded inside a garage with an ongoing tactical scene unfolding. The world famous Oscars red carpet is no more. This year's carpet has a new color, champagne. The new carpet color was unveiled at the annual Oscars carpet rollout on Los Angeles' storied Hollywood Boulevard just days before Sunday's ceremony. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we end tonight's rendition of world news with a dive into our neighboring Indians in northern Punjab state who celebrated the Sikh festival of Hola Mohalla, which is an annual spring festival featuring sport fights and martial arts. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and happy.